Okay, we'll wait a minute to see if people are seeing us on Facebook here. Okay. Yes, they are. Okay, it's live now. Excellent. All right, everybody. Welcome to Hollywood Kitchen. My name is Carrie Bible. And today we have a very fun and interesting episode. And it's certainly been an opportunity for me to learn a lot. Uh, my guest, Danny Miller, he is my special guest today. You might remember him from the Christmas cookie episode where we made Virginia Wilder's Christmas cookies in December. Danny is Jewish, which is funny that you are the Christmas cookie guy. And we talked about doing a whole episode about Jewish cooking. And we talked about originally doing Louis B. Mayer's famous matzo ball soup recipe from his family that was served for many years in the MGM commissary. But we wrote to the Mayer family and they didn't have the recipe. So Danny came up with an incredible idea. He said, what about Gertrude Berg? And I said, I have no idea who she is. And then after a quick search, I said, I can't believe I don't know who she is. I need to learn ASAP. So today, Danny Miller is going to take us on a journey through Gertrude Berg's incredible career and her cooking. So Danny, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, welcome to my kitchen. Last time we were in my dining room making uh, Christmas cookies. And by the way, uh, nothing weird about Jews making Christmas cookies because we basically, you know, we own Christmas, every great Christmas carol, all the great Christmas movies. You know, we love it. Kurt, bring on the carols. I went to a elementary school, it's a public school in Chicago that was probably, you know, 85% Jewish, but we were like all about the Christmas carols to the horror of our uh, immigrant grandparents. But anyway, I'm <laughs> thrilled to talk about Gertrude Berg. Here's a portrait of her. I think she is one of the, um, today, unfortunately, you know, unsung heroes. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and we'll talk more about her later, but she was every bit as much the entrepreneur uh, and the pioneer as Lucille Ball was in the 50s, but I mean, much earlier too. I mean, she really created her career first on radio, then on television, movies, Broadway, um, in a way that few women did back then. I mean, she just wouldn't take no for an answer. And the character of Molly Goldberg started with her in 1929 on the radio and existed for years through there. There was a Broadway play, there was a movie in 1950, there was the TV show that lasted until 1955. I mean, she was so identified with this character that it was almost quite unusual and weird um, that she, you know, she would never say, I am Molly Goldberg. Like I remember she was on um, the mystery guest on What's My Line a few times and she would sign in Gertrude Berg, but then her place card that they had was Molly Goldberg. And they would literally call her Molly. And she was really not that much like Molly, although she certainly identified with her. Molly was more like her parents, kind of immigrant. She was this very, you know, classy lady living on the Upper East Side, but she really so identified with that character that she would be on other shows like Milton Berle as Molly Goldberg and became a running bit there. But anyway, we can talk more about her great show. She, as many Jewish mamas are, was an amazing cook in real life as well. Although even this cookbook, and I have the first edition of this wonderful thing from 51, is this one is done as Molly Goldberg. I mean, it's, you know, it says somewhere, these are fictional characters, but she wrote it as Molly Goldberg. There's amazing, wonderful anecdotes and things about the food that I'm sure are really written from Gertrude Berg. And, and I'm sure, although she did collaborate with Myra Waldo, who was a very famous cookbook author then, um, I'm sure she had a big hand, unlike some of these celebrity cookbooks, in creating these recipes, including for her chicken soup, which we're going to make, um, which, you know, as you know, is often called Jewish penicillin. It cures what ails you. The minute there's even a hint of a cold in our house, you know, we've got the pots going. Um, so you want to start and throw that together, and then I might move to another room. We can talk more about Gertrude Berg. Absolutely. And I was amazed to find, too, not only did she write this cookbook, but it was such a hit cookbook mm -hmm. that it's been reprinted three different times over the decades. And when you told me about her, I picked up this on eBay, and this was reprinted in 2008. Which so is amazing to me. I wonder if it was in, if there was that documentary about her. I wonder if it came out in conjunction with that, but how great that it's being reprinted and there are wonderful recipes in there. Yeah, and I actually contacted the filmmaker behind the documentary, You Who Mrs. Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And that documentary made a lot of money for a documentary film. 
And I wrote to them saying, is this anywhere on streaming? I need to see this immediately. And the person wrote me back, no, you have to order the DVD. It's not on streaming yet. So I hope it comes out on streaming though, because this is something I just wanted to get right away so I could you know, learn more about her in, in documentary form. But what an amazing woman. She was a really amazing woman. And for people that want to see more of her, and we can talk about that later too, there's tons of clips on internet archive and whole episodes of the Goldbergs. I watched another one last night. I've been watching them all week. Um, and also appearances elsewhere. But shall we start with our chicken soup? Now this we is- shall. And I do want to preface, I'm making a super scaled down version for one, but Danny is making the full Monty version with the chicken feet, the whole nine yards. And I'm very impressed that you are doing this. The whole thing. And not only that, but I made another whole pot yesterday because I wanted to have some done and we practically finished it. So we're going to have chicken soup up to our tuchus, as the Jews would say. <laughs> That's so awesome. And I love going, at, I go to a farmer's market once a week. It's really my only outing during the pandemic, um, you know, at 3rd and Fairfax. And they have a poultry butcher. And I had him cut a beautiful chicken fresh uh, into eight pieces that I'm just going to. Normally, I would, it's already rinsed. And by the way, when you're working with raw chicken, keep everything impeccably clean. If you touch it, you know, be sure to wash your hands after, um, you know, if it's on your cutting board or anything. So you don't want anything. But so normally, I would. Um, rinse it and put it in a pot and then fill it with water. I'm just going to drop it in the water I've already filled. An entire chicken. If you get, in the old days, even at, at most butchers and maybe still when you get a chicken, you get the gizzards and stuff like that. And there's pieces of that that I would put in as well. Not the liver, I'd use that to make chopped liver. Do you ever have chopped liver, Carrie? I can't say that I have. Oh my God, you really need to. I'm washing my hands. Now, I've heard the expression a million times, what do you think I am, chopped liver? Like right. that's really common. I was sad to hear that one of my favorite restaurants on the Lower East Side in New York, uh, Sammy's Romanian, I think they shut down during the pandemic for good. They've been there for decades. When oh, you go right. there, they make it table side and there's a picture of chicken fat on every table. It's the best place in the world. I'm gonna move Gertrude over here. And normally, okay, so if you're really making this, you would then, um, Turn your heat on your water. You would bring it to a boil for a while and there's this scum that's gonna to come to the top that you wanna skim off. I'm not gonna do that because that just takes so long, but it's fine because you can just you know strain it a lot later. But I'm gonna show you, these are all the vegetables I put in one pot of soup. Maybe it looks like a lot. The one uh, extra one from Gertrude Berg, which I'm excited about is celery root. I, I just peeled half of it. I'm going to use half. It's kind of hard to peel, but I love celery root. I'd never even actually heard of that in chicken soup. So I like that idea. So I'm going to cut that. And chicken soup, as you know, making it just for one, I mean, it's very forgiving. You can do it with a couple pieces of chicken, a whole chicken, you know, the carcass of a roast chicken. Oh, I forgot my, one of my favorite parts to torment you with. Here's my chicken feet. Oh my gosh. I've got three of these. And that's, I don't normally do that either. That's, a, that's very much an old school thing. I'm sure my grandmother did, but it is wonderful because I made, I used some yesterday too, and it makes this richer, like kind of gelatinous um, texture that's just so good. So I'm going to drop those in. And then also, and she didn't suggest it in this, but this is a my family thing from our shtetl in Poland. I don't know what, but Marrow bones, now they're, you know, beef marrow bones, but that adds a lovely flavor. And then you have this amazing marrow that I can show you later. Um, and, and you don't have to, but I roasted them a little bit first. Uh, and I got these also from the regular butcher at Farmer's Market. They come out with this huge bone and they saw it on their thing. It's great if you have a good butcher. Wow. And then, so, you know, it's not like most of this stuff, I'm not going to serve with the um, soup. It's just for flavoring. So, you know, you don't have to like worry about cutting it all pretty or anything. I do take out the carrots later and cut them into little pieces for the soup. But for now, like I have, you know, relatives that just put them in whole. I just cut them in big chunks. And then with, um, this is all stuff that she had. Yeah, I don't usually use leeks either, but she said use a leek and an onion and that added a lovely texture too. 
you know, when you're using leeks, you want to cut it in half and then rinse all the leaves because there's a lot of dirt in there. But again, I'm going to do it very Jewish cuisine is not terribly fussy. It's just like, you know, but it's so good. I mean, I love it so much, but it's not like French where you're making everything so beautifully cut perfectly. So everything. Okay. I've got my ingredients right here. I boiled the chicken before we got on Zoom today. So mm -hmm. I've got my chicken boiled. I've got my parsley, onions, celery, and carrots. So do I just pour all of those into the chicken broth here on my, my plate? Yes. Again, normally if we are making a big pot, I would, I would cook the chicken for a while until the scum comes to the top, take that off, and then throw everything in. Gertrude's recipe says to cook the chicken for a whole hour before you put the vegetables in, which I never do. Again, cutting it very... And with the celery, and I like a lot of celery, you know, don't cut the leaves off. Everything adds flavor. Also, you know, these were recipes for people in the shtetls of Eastern Europe that uh, let's just say we're not rich people and you did not want to waste anything. So you're just, you know, and also soup is so great as you all know, whatever's in your fridge, just throw it in. If it's, if you think it might go, here's some celery. I didn't know that about the celery leaves, Danny, because I just have mine all kind of, yeah, well, it's, yeah. so, you know, that I might, if I, I probably wouldn't serve the celery because it gets really mushy, but if I did, I would cut it into little pieces like that. But, you know, you're, you are a more elegant cook than. No, no, no. <laughs> this is, I like root vegetables and I always add parsnips and turnips, which I've already peeled um, as well. In fact, I think I'll just throw those in whole. Okay, I'm going to throw mine in the pot here too. And then big, big chunks of onion. Sometimes this is a trick that some Jewish cooks do is you leave, you wash it thoroughly, but you leave the yellow skin on the onion and that adds some color too. You're gonna fish all this out later and, um, and strain it several times. And it's gonna be this delicious color, colorful, you know, but clear consomme that's so good. I didn't know that about leaving the skin on the onion either. I'm learning so much from you already. This is amazing. That's a trick that I heard in my family. I'm not sure, you know, but I would imagine some other people do that. There's also a thing some people do it. It has a special name in Yiddish. I had, I had friends, parents uh, who were Holocaust survivors who did this, whereas you make chicken soup one day. I could have done this because I made it yesterday. And then you make it again the next day, but you instead of putting the chicken in water, you put it in the already made chicken soup. And it's like, you know, you got a cold, you want to get rid of it. That's, you know, that's your, that's your COVID vaccine right there. Um, so I've got all that going. I'm just going to let that come to a boil, skim what I can with the vegetables already in there. But I wanted to show you, I also made Gertrude Berg's challah, which if you buy it's I'm sure it's in your copy too, which is lovely. You know, this is the traditional egg bread that Jewish people eat on um, Shabbat, which starts on Friday night. We, I used to go to my grandparents every Friday night for dinner, and I'll show you what it looks like on the inside. This is my grandparents' actual challah knife that I got after they died. Just that sound. And it has a lovely crumb, and it's really fantastic with chicken soup. I can't wait till the pandemic's over and I can come over to your house for me. Yeah, well, again, we've got plenty for you. I wish you were here now. I'm going to show you, I made some yesterday, so I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Well, hopefully after the pandemic, I'd like to reshoot a lot of these in person instead of over Zoom. So that is definitely a plan. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's just a beautiful, and here's, this is with my more genteel, I think I have one of my grandparents' silver spoons as well. You know, this, I've got the, veg, I, I put, I made rice and I have bits of the, the boiled chicken and carrots. That's really, some people leave all this stuff in there. I like it like this. And I'm just going to take a sip because I'm starving. I have them. Wow, I bet it smells great in there too. The next day too. It's, it's really good to make chicken soup the day before you're really going to serve it if you're doing it for crumb. The chicken fat congeals on top. And so I pulled it off of the one I made uh, yesterday. And here is this elixir that some people might be going, ew, gross. But, you know, for one thing, because of the laws of, of, of keeping kosher and you can't mix milk and dairy, we don't keep kosher, but my relatives certainly did. 
So you'd use that schmaltz, that liquid gold schmaltz instead of butter, you know, when you're making your latkes, if you're serving meat with it. And it's just delicious. And um, you can put it on bread. You know, these days, I mean, it's also will kill you. So people probably take off their chicken fat and throw it away, but it's, it's really good stuff. And uh, yeah, so I, I cut my carrots, I have my rice. This is the chicken from yesterday that I just like threw into a thing. And then when I serve, I, I have a little bar where people can add as much chicken or whatever they want. And that's it. Yesterday we even made um, one of her recipes for homentaschen, which is, you know, we just finished Purim. You heard about that Jewish holiday, mm -hmm. which is kind of, it's the story of Queen Esther and Haman and there's this thing. Now I made them on actual Purim two nights ago and they were delicious. And then I had some extra dough and I put it in, but I was making the soup and I just completely forgot about it. I was supposed to cook for 15 minutes. It was over an hour when I remembered that they were in there, but shockingly, and I think this is kind of symbolic of both Jews and Jewish cuisine. <laughs> it's just very forgiving and very hearty and will survive because they're actually quite good. I mean, how many cookies did you cook for an hour too long would still be edible, but we've been eating them since. So they're, you know, they're a little crisp and they have different fillings. That's, you know, that's another show for the, for the Jewish cookies. All right. Absolutely, I'd love to do that. <laughs> um, so, do, so maybe I'll move to the other room and we can talk more about um, Gertrude Berg's life and career. I'll just leave my chicken soup going. And I'll be working on that for the rest of the day to, because I cook it, you know, I forgot how much, how long she says to cook it for like an hour and a half. But, you know, you can cook that sucker all day long, the more the better as far as I'm concerned. Excellent. And there's things in her book, I'm curious to see yours, because I wonder if they updated it all to modern sensibilities. We can go like, through it if you want to on camera here. Well, so look, the page where you have the chicken soup, do you have that? Oh, uh, let's see, what page number is it? On mine, it's page 46. Let's see. I love this picture. Here she is with the cookbook author, Myra Waldo. Yeah, page 46 is the chicken soup. And so look on the page before, do you see something called pcha? Uh, yes, I do. Oh, so they, it's the full thing. So that, this is something my relatives often ate, but by the time my generation came, it was like, Oh God, no, because it's calf's foot soup and jelly. You make it with, and there's a lot of the, even in her recipe for using the um, chicken and the chicken feet, it's all about like scraping it and singeing the feathers off. You know, I love it, but thank God in this day and age, our, our butchers or our supermarkets do all that because <laughs> that's, that's really old school. Wow. I did find in one of uh, the magazines that I have, you know, one of those great pages that I'm sure you've used a lot on your show of the star and their, with the recipe. And so if we were doing this in the summer, this is Gertrude Berg's recipe for, wait for it, cottage cheese gelatin. Yes, you heard me, cottage cheese loaf that you like float in a, a clear gelatin. And this is really old. And it says Gertrude Berg, better known as Molly of the Goldberg, served salads these hot days. This cottage cheese loaf is one of her many favorites. Now these magazine ones, I, I'm always a little suspicious of, including you know the one we found for Virginia Wilder and stuff. But but who knows? She was definitely a big cook. And on the show, and I have a great picture here. Um, there's all, every episode takes place partly in the kitchen. Here she is with her chicken soup that we're making, um, you know, blowing on it. I mean, her husband, Jake comes in, have some soup. Let me give you some soup. Her kids, Sammy and Rosalie. Did you say you had a chance to watch some of the episodes? You know, I've been watching a lot of it this past week and it's been fun. I mean, that's the reason I, I jumped at the chance when you suggested this, because I thought I, I love to learn and I I'm just kind of amazed that I didn't know about this remarkable woman. One thing that jumped out at me, and this is starting to smell good, is how different her sitcom is from what we know today as modern sitcoms. Like today, they're very structured. There's certain beats, certain laughs. It's kind of, you know, and the Goldberg show, it's, it feels like kind of just a little slice of life. Like you're a fly on the wall in that apartment, just 
hanging out with that family. And so it took a little getting used to, but then I found myself very compelled by it. Like the other night, a friend called and I'm like, I can't talk right now. I have to find out if the Goldbergs get their apartment painted by the landlord. I'll call you later. <laughs> like I felt so invested in it, you know? Yeah, very much slice of life. And, 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 and although what was pioneering about it, it was about these Jewish immigrants and their American born children but you know very universal my mother-in-law who grew up in texas and probably you know didn't meet a jewish person until she was older um loved the show when she was little. a lot of people like didn't even realize but then they were seeing these examples i'm shocked i watched one episode the other day and it took place on yom kippur and they had the very famous um singer jan pierce do like the entire kol nidre which is the night before yom kippur which is the holiest day of the jewish year like the whole service. I mean, this is on network television. This was unheard of, you know, this is in the very early days of television. And there was in radio, when she started in 1929, there was the Yiddish radio. That was, a, and if you ever if you get a chance to listen to the NPR, they did like a 12 part series on Yiddish radio. That's amazing. But she, you know, wanted to be in this mainstream world and have people learn about this family. And at the time there was an enormous population of immigrants from many different places, not just Jewish, that, you know, kind of lapped up this family who was struggling. You know, the parents were kind of, everything was kind of new. The kids were very American, very assimilated. Um, I was gonna show you my great grandparents who were the immigrants from Eastern Europe from a town called Stashev in Poland. I have them right here. And oh. then compare that look. And they were, I mean, back in the day, they were Hasidic. They, uh, and then compare that to my parents who were literally Rob and Laura Petri, you know. Um, so the it was it's very interesting that the whole, you know, and unfortunately, in a lot of those cases, like with my parents' generation, like don't talk Yiddish, you know, wish, later they all wish that they had learned it. Um, but there was always this push-pull struggle of like, you know oh, the old ways, that's so, you know, that's part of our heritage. And then like, oh, no, let's be American. And you see that on the Goldbergs a lot too, this kind of struggle um, with that. So, you know, and it started when uh, Molly, uh, um, Gertrude Berg's name was Tilly Edelston. In real life, she did marry a man named Berg and, and Gertrude was another form of her name. But um, her father, when she was a little girl, she was born in 1899 in New York. Her parents were immigrants. Her father came from Russia. And at one point when she was a little girl, he bought a one of those amazing then Jewish uh, resorts in the Catskills for $500. He got this resort. And she was, I think, a teenager then possibly. And she was always into writing. And so she started writing these sketches. And there was this character that later became Molly Goldberg that she would just perform for the, you know, and then they loved her. She was a great performer. She was a wonderful writer. She wrote every single episode of that show. On radio alone, there were over 5,000 scripts over the years. And she wrote it longhand. She didn't, you know, they had a typewriter, I mean, but she just wrote longhand for her whole life. And uh, there's a funny story about how her handwriting was not easy to decipher. So her, later for the TV show, her husband would type it out and then pass it around. But when she was first trying to sell her radio show, she would just bring her yellow pads of her scrawled scripts in to these executives that she would just like really just, you know, wouldn't stop until they would meet with her. And they were like, I, I can't read a word of this. So she would perform it. She would perform the whole thing, all the parts. And that's what got her on the radio because they saw this is, this is golden, she's amazing. And so, you know, it started in 1929. It always had, she has her, um, Uncle David, who's really off the boat, you know, very strong accent. And then her kids, very American, Sammy and Rosalie. They grew up on the on the um, radio show and I think even got married and stuff. But then when the TV show started in, in 1950, they were teenagers again. There was one of these wonderful actors who stayed with it for years. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it was a dynasty and, you know, it's funny when the Goldbergs, the show starring Jeff Garland and, you know, that started now, it's like, what, the Goldbergs are coming back? They're rebooting the Goldbergs? <laughs> That's a very different thing, although some of the same issues. Um, here's, a, here's a picture I have of the, t the radio show cast, if you can see that. And then here's the TV cast. It's one of the only color pictures I ever found of them, oh, which wow. I love. And 
almost every episode took place in the kitchen. Like you say, they were talking about, you know, issues that are very day-to-day -day issues that families grapple with. The one I watched last night though was from the last year. Um, and it was about Rosalie wanting to get a nose job because she thought, you know, her Jewish nose, which frankly the actress didn't really have, but that was the plot line, you know, was like she was ugly. And then, so they dealt with some heavy issues too, including in the radio show, which was on throughout World War II, family members they were trying to bring over who, you know, were ultimately killed in the Holocaust. Uh, um, Crystal Nacht in 1938, they had an episode on that. So this was, you know, at a time when there was a ton of anti-Semitism in the United States, for many people, this was their exposure to Jewish people. And, you know, it was a very helpful thing in terms of these were beloved characters. Uh, Molly was just beloved in every way. You know, what episode really stayed with me that I watched this week. Uh, there's so many of them all over YouTube. It's the one where their friend's baby gets really sick. Mm. And then they go to the synagogue and I didn't understand the, the words, but they were singing this very powerful song. And mm. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I felt devastated in any case. Sure, you got yeah. the emotions, which is what she was always going for. Exactly. Yeah, it was really, and it wasn't like hit you over the head obvious with a message. It just kind of was there. And I thought that was like really powerful. Mm-hmm. There was also a feature film. I had this is the this is an ad for that. It says, "What has the Bronx got that Brooklyn hasn't got?" The 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 Goldbergs lived in uh, the Bronx on Tremont Avenue, and the thing that I find hysterical about this this is Barbara Rush, who's a good friend of ours. I as I think you know, um, came to the TCM festival with us a few times and has talked there. Yeah. She's, that was her first film. Now she is the quintessential shiksa, you know, non-Jewish woman. And there was a whole thing where she was uh, one of their best friends brought over his new girlfriend, Debbie, played by Barbara Rush. And they were really de dealing with interfaith relationships. Cause at first they were all just like, you know, mouths on the floor, shocked that Debbie, you know, was not Jewish, but then they dealt with it. And it was, it was a, lo a lovely moment. They really dealt with issues that you didn't see get dealt with um, in movies or TV or radio, really. I mean, you know, for an industry that was so largely, you know, run by many Jewish honchos and executives, you could count on your hand the number of known Jewish characters in like classic film. I mean, how many can you think of? You know, there's a, you, many of the actors were Jewish that were playing non-Jewish parts, but it just, if it, if there was a movie, I mean, you know, one of the first ones that comes to mind, but that was later in the 50s was Gentleman's Agreement about anti-Semitism, which was so interesting. And even there, you had non-Jewish character and actors pretending they were Jewish. It was like almost too shocking to show actual <laughs> Jews. And there was this story that I always loved from um, MGM, where in that great scene in Woman of the Year, where Katherine Hepburn is to show how powerful she was around the world, and she's on the phone talking French to some official in Paris, and then talking to someone in Italy. And in the original script, there was supposedly a scene of her, of a moment of her speaking Yiddish, and they were just too scared to let Katherine Hepburn speak Yiddish in a major film, so they cut that part. You know, you know, I've been reading this book by Neil Gabler called An Empire of Their Own about how the Jewish executives created Hollywood. And it definitely speaks to what you're talking about, how they would change the names of the performers to make them sound you know, different, how they would sort of erase their Jewish roots. Um, a few years ago, Mary Mallory and I co-wrote a book called Hollywood Celebrates the Holidays. And it's mm -hmm. basically photos and captions of stars at Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, et cetera. And when we were working on the book, we spent an eternity at the Academy Library and other places going through all these old publicity photos. And one of the questions we, would, we got asked a lot when the book first came out is why aren't there Jewish holiday photos and the stars with the menorah or whatever. And Mary and I looked at each other and we were like, we tried. It wasn't for lack of trying. It's just we couldn't find it, you know. Very rare. And, you know, you also have to remember that Hanukkah kind of became like Jewish Christmas. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but because of the time of the year that it occurred. But I mean, I did a series on my own blog back then called um, Hollywood Jews Celebrate Christmas, which featured 
Jewish people in their personal lives with their Christmas trees and their things, you know, Milton Berle and, uh, you know, Lauren Bacall, of course she was with Humphrey Bogart, but you know, all these, you know, it, with uh, Dinah Shore, um, the Gabor sisters are Jewish, Paulette Goddard, all sorts of people, um, you know, and that was also just the assimilation of the time too. Um, Gertrude Berg, I also have this, which I treasure, which is uh, her autobiography called Molly and Me. You can never find that. There's great pictures. Oh, wow. And that goes into her entire childhood, the cat skills thing, the struggle to get her show on the radio, um, all the stuff that happened to her. It, it ends, this was written in 61, just when she was off to Broadway for an extremely successful run in, she was the original woman star of uh, a majority of one. You might be familiar with the Rosalind Russell movie with Alec Guinness. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, today it would never stand where Alec Guinness was playing the Japanese man that she got involved with. And in, oh, geez, yeah. and in the uh, Broadway play, it was Cedric Hardwick of all people playing Japanese, but they got along great. And, my, and Gertrude Berg won a Best Actress Tony Award for that. Just as she had won uh, years earlier, the very first Best Actress Emmy Award for Molly Goldberg which, you know, people don't, I don't remember seeing her mention much on the Emmy broadcast, you know, but she was the first Best Actress winner. Um, it's kind of sad to me that she is largely forgotten except by people that, you know, had relatives that watched the show or they saw it themselves. Yeah, she's kind of hiding in plain sight in a way. And that just, it just blows my mind that I didn't know about her. Like I, I get it, I feel terrible that I did it because I should, what an inspiring, innovative, creative, incredible lady. I mean, I think by the time the show was canceled in 1955, well, first of all, we should talk, just mention the, they did have this one big scandal that like interrupted the show. Uh, the man playing her husband on the show who, and he started in the Broadway, there was a Broadway play in 1948. I think it was called Made, Meet the Goldbergs or something that was a big hit, ran for a while. And the guy she got to play her husband, Philip Loeb, went on, who a very, very renowned actor, went on to be the husband in the first year of the TV series. Well, he was named in the early 50s in that god awful Red Channels uh, pamphlet th that you talked about last week with Judy Holliday, who was also named as a communist. He wasn't, and even if he were, I mean, a lot of the people in that, like Judy Holliday as well, were liberal Jews fighting for certain causes that were deemed by the people that were doing things like, you know, the, in the McCarthy uh, era, dangerous to America, you know. Um, so the sponsor, I think General Foods at that time, <clears throat> everyone was just running scared. And they were like, he can't, we're canceling the show because we can't have someone that's named in there. And Gertrude Berg, to her great credit, you know, and she had a lot of clout at this point and she fought vigorously for, to keep him uh, and he didn't want to, you know, bring down her show. So he voluntarily quit and um, they recast the part, but she quietly kept paying him, um, you yeah. know, salary because she felt horrible about it. And she really did, you know, and this was, this was a risk for her. She openly fought it, you know, in the press. She was very upset about it. Well, sadly, you know, he, he still got paid, but he couldn't get any acting work. And he ended up like so many, he killed himself. He committed suicide in 1955. Uh, and it's just one of the tragedies, you know, and, but the show, he wanted the show to go on because he thought it was too important. And so they recast, um, but you know, that's a shameful episode, obviously in American history. Absolutely. Uh, that, that touched her. And, fr and frankly, I'm surprised, you know, that she didn't get dragged down in it herself, but she was just a very powerful and beloved woman. I mean, she she would always speak her mind, but it's never, you know, she 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 wanted to appeal to the largest possible group. And so she, you know, let's just say she was really nice to people like the sponsors. <laughs> Well, one thing I noticed, I kind of noticed a lot of stuff, you know, kind of going on my binge watch of it this past week. She's got a very gentle, reassuring presence about her. Mm -hmm. 
And you just sort of feel like everything is going to be okay because Gertrude's here and Gertrude's got it, you know? And also in the beginning when she's leaning out the window and she's pitching the sponsor, like be it Senka Coffee or whatever, right there, yeah. She's, she does it in a way that doesn't feel like a celebrity show. It feels like your neighbor leaning out the window going, hey, Danny, so there's like this coffee. If mm-hmm. you're really tired, you should drink. Like, it's just so gentle. And it feels like it's part of the show instead of being like throwing the brakes on the show to plug something. It's kind of astounding. Every week she would start the show in the window, talking to the audience, breaking the third wall or fourth wall, whatever that's called. And she would be shilling the product, whether it was, you know, Geritol or Sanka or, you know, other things. And you're right. It seemed like she was doing it as Molly Goldberg and talking about how, you know, Rosalie used that the other day or, you know, she gave Jake Sanka so he could fall asleep at night and wasn't kept up. And then she would turn around. I mean, no one else ever broke that wall. They were just, yeah. seen, you know, inside the inside the window. Uh, I love that. You know, and the window also came up in the show where she would, the big thing was, you know, she would say, you who Mrs. Bloom, one of her neighbors, and they would talk as people did in the tenements. That's where they lived in the Bronx um, through the windows. Um, And that was wonderful. In the last year of the show, it was, they moved to the suburbs. And if there was ever a jump the shark moment in the Goldbergs, in my humble opinion, it was that because, you know, they were just, this was a time in the, in America where a lot of these waves of immigrants, you know, the, the actual immigrants were getting older. And as I said earlier, there was this mad obsession with assimilation and upward mobility. I mean, don't get me wrong. That's, you know, a lot of Jews did move out of the tenements at that time and move to the suburbs, but it just lost the appeal for me. I mean, I still love the shows and that was where, you know, Rosalie was wanting her nose job because she was with all these Christian girls at our high school <laughs> with their perfect noses. I mean, they dealt with heavy issues, but I missed the New Yorkness, the Bronx. Um, and then it was canceled because, you know, again, this show was in, in many ways, you know, for this large immigrant community, wherever they were from. And that was just changing on television to, you just had to be leave it to Beaver, you know, and I love all those shows, but Father Knows Best. And it this is, you know, pe- things became much more homogenized and her, the ethnic nature of the Goldbergs, you know, it just wasn't as palatable. Um, she tried one more sitcom after her huge success in a majority of one with Cedric Hardwick, the two of them did this show where she was a grandma going back to college. This was, I think, in the, in the early 60s. Um, called Mrs. Mrs. G goes to college or something. Her name wasn't Molly Goldberg. It was a different character, but it was Molly Goldberg. And it was fun and funny, but that only lasted a season. And then she died in 1966 of, of heart failure. But she, you know, she pre- had a pretty amazing life. And she, you know, she was two on her way to an EGOT with the first Emmy and a, a Best Actress Tony. Um, if, you know, and she got most of those opportunities on her own. You know, if she had, you know, who knows what she could have accomplished if they had really, you know, put her in parts in films. She never did that many, but she even wrote for others. Like she did some Bobby Breen movies, if you know him at all. Um, she was a great writer. She was a really good writer for dialogue that sounded natural. Um, and if you do get a chance to see that documentary, you really have to watch it to appreciate all that she accomplished. Pretty amazing. Yeah, it's been it's been really fun kind of learning about someone completely new to me because every one of these episodes I've done so far, pretty much I had an idea or I'd seen a ton of the work of this person. So this is the first one I've done where I've gone in knowing absolutely nothing and then just learned from the ground up. And yeah, I recommend to anybody that's watching our show here to please look these up on YouTube and watch them. They're very easy to find. And Again, they're, they're different from the sitcoms of today, but I think if you just sort of know that going in and be patient with it and sort of let it unfold, you'll be really glad you did. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you about the move to the suburbs because I think in a lot of television shows, the city becomes a character. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the Golden Girls Miami was every bit as much of a character as the ladies on the show. And you know, there's a lot of shows like that where the city is such a part of it that if you took that city out, then it's just not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, when Molly Goldberg left TV in 1955, and that was before I was born, I saw these shows later on, obviously. 
but Jews just disappeared. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember when the show, and I'm sure you'd probably never even heard of it, called Bridget Loves Bernie came on. It was starring the then married couple, I ended up having a hideous divorce, but that's another story, of David Bernie and Meredith Baxter Bernie. Um, and he was Jewish and she was not, and they got together. And so he, you know, she, uh, he had his Jewish parents played by these great actors and she had her non-Jewish parents and there was a lot of conflict. Oh my God, an uh, interfaith couple. But we were like riveted because there just weren't Jews on television. There were certainly Jewish actors. And then like right now during the pandemic, we went through all the Dick Van Dyke shows. <laughs> we watched a different show every night with my 11 year old son. And then we switched to the Mary Tyler Moore show and Rhoda Morgenstern, similar, even though Valerie Harper was not Jewish, but neither was Nancy Walker who played Ida Morgenstern, the two quintessential Jewish characters in television, but they were fantastic and they were worshiped by the Jewish community and others. And again, like with the Goldbergs, for some people in the country, this is their introduction to Jewish people and in all their, you know, in, in all their flavors. Um, Today, I guess it's not that unusual, but you know, and then there were shows later on like Brooklyn Bridge and you know, some others, but um, there was a lot of homogenization and Jewish people, you know, so for the Goldbergs to be from day one of like network television, this enormous hit, um, that was something. That was her pushing against the grain for sure. And I think the last couple of years with like movies like Black Panther, Crazy Rich Asians, there's been so much talk in Hollywood and in the media about how representation matters. And it does, because I think everybody deserves to have a voice and deserves to be seen. And I think for a long time, that wasn't the case. And I'm really glad there's such a push for that right now. Totally, yeah. And certainly, you know, as a Jewish kid growing up, you know, I mean, and, and, and people, you know, anyone from any group is looking for someone that kind of reminds you of your family or looks like you. And it serves an important function, but all the better when it becomes this universal thing. And then it's not about, like a lot of even the movies about that featured Jewish characters, they were about anti-Semitism. And that's great. And those stories should be written. But I remember even when Yentl came out in the 80s, Barbara Streisand's Yentl, of course, another icon of Jewish families everywhere. But it was so amazing because it was about this other world in Eastern Europe but not about, it was not about like, oh, should I leave? Should I stay? Oh, we're being persecuted. It was, just wasn't about that. It was just about a story about people living in that life as they had for hundreds of years. You know, all that stuff we knew was gonna come. Um, and we're happy Yentl left at the end and came to the United States. But you know, it's just, yeah, it was, it's quite rare to have. So the Goldbergs just being a family, sure, their Judaism was, Judaism was part of it. And she'd say Yiddish words and she'd be constantly making Jewish food. You know, maybe people started making chicken soup because they saw it on the Goldbergs and when her cookbook came out. But um, it wasn't, you know, about their persecution or anything like that. It was just about people trying to make it in the United States. And I think that's something we can, so we can all relate to there's so many things in that show like even though I was raised Southern Baptist in Texas originally like I could watch it and say yeah I know what it's like to argue with your dad or try to get the landlord to do something or try to you know have an annoying relative that visits and they have all these issues like when Aunt Hialeah visited them so you know like I think there's such a universality in the situations that it doesn't matter where you're from or what religion or culture you can relate to the struggles and the problems and the annoyances of like everyday life. And, and even feel so out of place. Like, you know, they like, like the parents sometimes did in the, in, in New York. And maybe you did when you first moved to LA. I mean, you know, we oh, all yeah. are at one point are, 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 are fish out of water. And those themes are pretty universal and they were handled so well with such compassion in this, you know, and there were times when, I mean, the, the nose job episode, as I'm now calling it, which I was kind of shocked to discover, it was, there were some really interesting conversations about, you know, self-hatred and, you know, and there was this interesting thing where she was trying to get Jake and everyone at the, at the dinner table to, you know, tell Rosalie she's really pretty because she, she didn't know that they knew that she was saving money to get a nose job. And then she smelled a rat and got very upset and, you know, felt like a big freak. And I mean, it was, 
they dealt with powerful stuff, even though a lot of the episodes, you know, in a Seinfeld kind of way, weren't exactly about that much. You know, it wasn't like there were major um, plot points that were, you know, someone was, you know, being killed or something. No, it was just about everyday life. Yeah, I think there's certain movies and TV shows that I, I kind of say that they're like a bottle of wine or something. You just have to let them breathe. Like mm -hmm. in our world today, a lot of stuff seems so rapid fire with the editing or the style of it. And there's some movies or shows that I think if you're just patient with watching them and sort of give them enough time, it really rewards you at the end. Mm -hmm. And despite like, I also give uh, Gertrude Berg a lot of credit. You know, there are stereotypical aspects of the Jewish experience that obviously come up in the show from Rosalie wanting a no job to you know, certain personality traits, but they were rich, full characters. I mean, like in the classic cliche, the mother would be the, you know, the one who was like controlling everything and the father's just like reading the papers. You know, that's one of the cliches, one of the tropes in Jewish American life. And that, that was not the case, you know, they had a good relationship, a good marriage. They would talk to each other about stuff. Sure, she was a strong personality who when she had something in her mind, it was gonna, you know, get done. But but uh, I really appreciate it because it could have gone really two dimensional. It could have just been, you know, a total caricature um, of, of, of Jewish people at that time. And it wasn't, it was much cheaper. And I think that's why it caught on, why she won the Emmy, why people loved the show who, you know, probably never knew a Jewish person because of, 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 of the nature of her personally and her and what she brought to it. I think it was great that she never did hire a writer's room. You know, this was her baby and uh, try doing that today. First of all, you know, just the work. Can you imagine oh, yeah. that she was starring in a show every week and writing the entire script? And they had amazing people on, like on the radio show, by the way, like Garson Kanan was a regular for a while as when he was an actor as a kid. They had all sorts of people who wanted to be on their show uh, come in and out. So it was, it was it, it's, it's something that should be known at least in terms of television and cultural history for sure. Well, she really deserves to be rediscovered by a whole new generation of people because Again, I'm, I'm really glad you suggested this. I really had a lot of fun kind of spending time with her this past week. Well, I was so excited when I saw in our celebrity cookbook pile that we, you know, had her book because I've been going through it. I mean, there's a bunch of things I'm going to make from this, you know, things that remind me of my childhood, but, you know, you just don't think to make. There's this poppy seed candy that is only made at Purim time that I already told my son this morning we're going to make. You know, there's things that are, it would probably send shivers through your spine, like kishke made in the small intestines of a cow and stuff like that, and pacha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not gonna go the pacha route, but there's really great food here. And, and yeah, were, were we talking off camera about gefilte fish, how you ran into that once? And yeah, I went, I was in the store one day and I see this jar and it says gefilte fish on it. And I picked it up and I was like, what in the world is this stuff? It looked like a fish that just been thrown into a blender and someone hit the puree button or something. And I, know I was what very confused. <laughs> I love gefilte fish. Of course, I love my grandmother's homemade gefilte fish. And they're, you know, back in the day, Jewish people had like the carps, live carps swimming in their bathtub. So it was super fresh. And it was before, I remember, God, how did they, I'm sure people, some people watching like will remember how it was made, but I mean, it was a lot of work. Today you can buy the ground, the fish already ground, there's no bones, the skin, the guts. But back in the day, it was a it was a work, but it's you know like a fish dumpling. Um, and speaking of getting back to our soup, I just want to tell people like I made rice for for mine, but I think there's even a recipe for noodles, and of course, you know, just like thick egg noodles, but also wonderful things, of course, like matzo balls. When we were looking for the LB Mayer at MGM, they always had in the commissary, they always had LB Mayer's matzo ball soup on the menu and matzo balls are great. I just couldn't deal with making two pots of soup and matzo balls today, but also kreplach. Do you know what kreplach are? I don't. A wonderful, what, what would it be like? Like almost like a pierogi or a wonton even. It's dough. You make this dough that you roll out and then you put like a meat filling in and then pinch it 
and cook it in the soup and it's like to die for. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, and that, or, or kasha, which is I think buck, what is it? Buckwheat groats or something like that. Um, lots of different things that Jewish people like to put in their chicken soup. And then you can go to like big delis and get the mishmash, which is like a little bit of everything, rice, noodles, krepla, matzo ball. Um, it's the stuff that dreams are made of. I encourage everyone to make Molly Goldberg's, and her recipe is very simple. And again, you can go as elaborate or as simple as you want, but it's good stuff. And also before off camera, we were talking about a lot of the really famous Jewish delis. And I wanted to briefly, you know, because of the pandemic, a lot of our restaurants in Los Angeles have struggled really badly. And I try really hard, like once a week or every other week to go to a different restaurant and get a to-go meal just to help do what I can to support them. So let's encourage people to maybe try to get some takeout at Langer's Deli or Greenblatt's or Cantor's if you happen to live in Los Angeles. If you're in LA, in my humble opinion, and I, I live pretty close to there, Langer's, which was in the old Jewish neighborhood, is the, that's the top of the line. That is their pastrami sandwich, number 19, is uh, second only, in my opinion, to Katz's on the Lower East Side of New York, where the uh, I'll Have What She's Having scene was filmed and when Harry met Sally. I wouldn't dream of going to New York without going to Katz's. And you know, I love Canners and they're all great too. Canners is really fun and has a great history, but boy, Langer's is the place to go. I'm sure everyone in every city that has Jewish delis has their, their special one, but they hand cut the pastrami, they double bake the rye bread. It's the real deal. And I'm sure there were, there were, there were many cold cuts, you know, being served in the Goldberg sets as well. I'm not saying this food was always the healthiest choice. And if you look at Molly Goldberg, it's not like she, you know, defines uh, modern uh, images of, you know, health and slimness, but uh, that's, you know, we're looking for food to really dig our teeth into and to survive on. And it's so delicious, yum. Well, should we go online and see if anybody's asking us questions? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I don't have my... Can okay, let me see if let me see if it'll work this time for me. Let's see here. Okay, we have 36 comments. Ah, I this hope is we're a wonderful getting... episode. When's the next one? That's a great question. The next one will be Sunday, March 7th at 12 noon. Stay tuned. Announcement coming. Excellent show. I'm learning so much. Oh, that's great. I, I want someone to make this a strummy sandwich. Oh, who said that? Uh, that was Mindy Garza. Oh, she's never tried a pastrami sandwich? Okay, I know Mindy. Oh. We're going to Langer's as soon as we can, Mindy. Come on. My yeah. friend Benjamin in Germany says mishmash is such a nice word. <laughs> Barbara Boyd Doss says learning so much. Thank you. Christina DeVita Phillips. I love it. Um, Mindy Garza says, I remember Bridget loves Bernie. Yeah, Crystal Waller says, very interesting. I need to watch this show. Yeah, I definitely hope that from this episode, people will consider looking into her extraordinary life. And I tried to do a blog post. I have a little blog now, hollywoodkitchenshow.com. Mm -hmm. And when I get the blog post up, probably by tonight, I want to post some YouTube episodes and some books and some links probably more so than I usually do. So people can really dig in because like when I do an episode on Marilyn Monroe, I feel like there's like zero introduction needed because people know who that is. But someone like Gertrude Berg, I think she really warrants a serious amount of backstory introduction and resources. So people can really do a deep dive on their own and learn all about her. And in addition to some episodes of the Goldbergs, I would include one of her, she was on uh, twice as the mystery guest on What's My Line? Because that gives you a feel. And also the fact that they're calling her Molly Goldberg. I don't know if that drove her nuts or if she liked it, but it's kind of crazy to, to identify to that extent that they're literally thinking that her name was Molly Goldberg. But anyway, those are fun. And some of her appearances as Molly on Milton Berle. There's a lot out there that you can still see, fortunately. Definitely. And it's just been so much fun to discover her. And again, I think she really deserves a lot more attention and is ripe for rediscovery. I do too. I do too, very much so. And, uh, you know, if, especially for most of the country, this is the perfect time to have a big 
steaming pot of chicken soup going on your stove, which by the way, Molly Goldberg and probably Gertrude Berg always had. I mean, there was never a scene, I don't care what time of the day or night it was, there was like a pot of soup on the stove. So come in from the cold, from work, you you know, you're, it's lunchtime, whatever, just have some soup, which I'll be saying to my family for the next two days because I have copious amounts. <laughs> and also, if any of you want to try your hand at Molly Goldberg's food and Jewish cuisine, I found the 1998 reprint, or maybe it's 2008 reprint of her cookbook for like $7 on eBay. So this is very affordable, very easy to find, and I definitely recommend it. Try some crepla, try some chicken soup. Uh, there's so many great ch chopped liver. You gotta try some chopped liver. I gotta get some chopped liver into you, Carrie, come on. Well, after the pandemic, we should have a dinner party and just yeah. make different recipes from a Gertrude's cookbook together in your kitchen and uh, film it, do a special Perfect. episode. Very good. Very good. Well, this has been so great, Danny. Thank you so much for joining me again. I greatly appreciate it. Thrilled to talk about this again, as far as I'm concerned, pioneer of, of television and radio. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Danny. And we'll definitely have you back on Hollywood Kitchen. Thank you to everybody for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.